Welcome everybody. Namaste. Good morning. Welcome to the School Meals in the Times of COVID-19 webinar. Uh, this is the first of the part two series uh, that's organized collectively by the Learning Exchange of School Meals Program Network in India. Hello, my name is Mamta and I'm one of the moderators for today's session uh, where we'll delve into the impact that school closures have had on India's midday meals scheme and the world's largest school food program and how state governments have responded to the crisis. We'll also get a global perspective from one of the most prominent names in the school feeding and child health industry. But first, let's take a quick note uh, about the learning exchange of school meals program. Uh, what I wanna say is, you know, this network is facilitated by the Global Child Nutrition Foundation or GCNF in short. Uh, GCNF has long believed that the best way for countries to build durable, nutritious school meals program is to learn directly from peers. In India, it's been really positive. We've been working for the last almost two years, and it's been so encouraging to collaborate with key stakeholders on this initiative, uh, including many of our colleagues who are here on this webinar today, uh, the World Food Program, Akshay Patra Foundation, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation, the Manna Trust and IP Global. I'm also pleased to announce that our newest partner on board is Tata Trust, who will uh, be on the webinar next week. So I hope we can, you can also join us there. So we're really delighted for all of you who've made time to be with us. Uh, I know this event has generated a lot of interest and we have uh, people tuned in, not just from India, but across the region, uh, as far as the Pacific countries. So that's exciting. Um, before I introduce our first speaker, some basic housekeeping notes. Uh, the session is going to be live streamed on IPE's Facebook account. So please feel to share it with friends and colleagues, especially those who might not have had a chance to register but are interested to join the webinar. Uh, CJ, perhaps we can put up the link on the chat box uh, so people can share. During the event, our colleagues will also be posting highlights on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, so I would say if you're an avid social media user, feel free to use the hashtag school meals, hashtag midday meals, hashtag COVID-19, hashtag nutrition. And for those of you who are creative out there, maybe you'll, you'll propose some uh, new ones that we could also use. Uh, we will also have a Q&A session later. So if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A feature, not the chat feature, but the Q&A feature on your screens to post them. And uh, we'll try to go through as many of them as possible. Uh, if your question is directed for a specific speaker, please make sure you indicate the name so we know who to direct it to. What else? In between, we'll also be running an audience poll and we'll be sharing the results immediately. So we hope you'll participate in these. Uh, I think I've covered most of the housekeeping notes. So without further ado now, uh, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Donald Bundy, who joins us today from London. Uh, I'm sure this is not an unfamiliar name to many of us who are on, uh, but Dr. Bundy uh, is a professor of epidemiology and development at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He has worked for more than 30 years on school health and nutrition and serves as a senior advisor in many prominent institutions, including the World Food Program, the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, the World Bank, and several national governments. Previously, he was the deputy of the global health team of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, was also the lead health specialist at the World Bank, Professor uh, Bandi undoubtedly has held an illustrious academic positions at the University of Oxford, at the Imperial College London, and the University of the West uh, Indies as well. He has authored more than 390 books and scientific publications, and I'm sure you know, many of us who are working in the school feeding have read his, uh, many of his uh, publications, uh, including he's uh, been instrumental in bringing the, all the three edition of the World Bank's Disease Control Priorities, or commonly known as the DCP series. Uh, and it doesn't just end there. Professor Bundy, to his credit, has produced award-winning documentary films on the role of public health in development and is the founder of the Partnership for Child Development, a civil society organization that promotes health and education in more than 50 countries. 
Professor, I don't know how you juggle all these roles, but you're truly an inspiration. It's an honor to have you with us today, thanking uh, you for the time you've made waking up so early. Uh, welcome and over to you. Good morning, Namaste. Thank you very much for, uh, for that very kind in introduction. It's, uh, it's for me a real pleasure and honor to be part of this uh, very distinguished panel. It's, uh, it's extraordinary to work with a, a group that's the directing the largest school feeding program in the world, the largest public health program in, in the world. Um, and I can't for, uh, omit to mention that India also has the the largest school-based health program in the, uh, uh, the National Deworming Days program, treating 200 million children a year, twice. Um, so it really is a, a pleasure, and I find myself humbled by the, the efforts that you have successfully put in place. Um, I, I've had the pleasure of working in India in a professional capacity since the 1980s uh, on a regular basis, and uh, it's been uh, a, a really fantastic part of my life experience to, to do that. And so I, I appreciate this opportunity to, to continue. Um, but I'm not here to talk about uh, India. That's the, the rest of you are much better qualified for that. I've been asked to come along and talk more generally about the issues of school feeding and specifically school feeding in the, in the times of, of COVID. Um, let, let me say that I was asked at the end of last year by the American, uh, American Society for Nutrition to give a keynote address to their annual meeting on why it was important to care about the nutrition of, of children five to nine years of age, so the, 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 the main primary school target group for school feeding. Why was that, in, why was that important? Um, and they asked me to do that because we'd, we'd recently published uh, disease control priorities, the uh, um, uh, volume eight, uh, which focused on child and adolescent health and which concluded weren't doing enough for children generally in, in the world, not for school children specifically, for this five to nine year old age group and indeed uh, for, for young adolescents. Um, so that's why they'd asked me, that was the topic and that was very topical and important. And my goodness me, that's only a few months ago but by the time I came to give that uh, lecture, I had to talk about COVID. COVID had come along and COVID had changed many things, reinforcing the importance of, of what we were doing in, in, in the world in feeding school children. Um, I, I should also, just for open declaration, say I have a very personal interest in COVID because I am, in fact, a, a COVID survivor. I was one of the early, the early ones who succumbed in, um, in March. Um, so, you know, good news for we old people is that some of us do survive. So that's uh, uh, so that's good. But the the uh, I, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to talk with you today about both topics. So I'm going to first focus on the issue of of uh, school feeding, and then I'm going to focus on the issue of why COVID, why it's even more important now that we're in uh, in a time of of, of COVID. Um, and I'm going to start us off with the slides here. I'm just hoping this all will work. Yep. Good. So, as I said, I'm going to focus on, uh, um, first of all, I'm going to focus on the issue of, uh, the, the, uh, of school feeding. I'm going to talk about a life cycle approach, why we need to think beyond the first thousand days of life to think about the next 7,000 days, the so-called 8,000 days, how neglected that is as an area and, 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 and why that might be, how the schools can be the key solution to that problem, and then finally why COVID-19 is important in, in our thinking around, uh, around this area. You know, and a lot of people think that when we talk about, I'm, I'm, I'm sure this is a common experience for all of us, when we talk about school feeding and, and, and the health of school children, people behave as though that's some sort of niche area, some sort of small area, uh, area, area of work. But, you know, it, it, it absolutely isn't. If we, if we, you know, one of the remarkable things about 2020, apart from the arrival of COVID, is that this is the first year in which the world's population has had a median age above 30. The average age in the world is today is 30. Um, 
But if we look across the, uh, uh, across the globe, uh, that varies considerably. So here in the UK, um, the average age is 40. In India, it's, it's around 30. In India is about around the, the average for the, for the globe. Um, but then countries like, like Mali, or Niger, their average age is 15. Remarkably different demographics. And in, in countries where, where such young ages are, are typical, we can see that more than half of the population are actually young people, people under 19. Um, even, even in India, I think the latest figures are that, that um, something around 38, 39% of the population is, is, is un, under 18. Um, in the UK, the figure is much smaller, at around 16%. Um, but nevertheless, the, none of these numbers, none of these proportions are small. The, this is a very important, very substantial group of the population uh, in terms of size. And of course, it's vitally important because it's actually the ages at which we, uh, we first develop. It's where we, where we begin to become adults. Um, and looking at those, those issues of child and adolescent health and development was a task that uh, some of us took up uh, seven years ago as part of the World Bank and uh, Bill and Melinda Gates sponsored work on um, uh, child and adolescent health and development. Um, and I'm, I'm just I'm not advertising the book, which is, by the way, free and, and uh, available. DCP3, DCP3 hyphen um, is, uh, is the website and you can, you can just download any, any part of the book. So not advertising it, except in the sense that the 110 authors got together and asked the question, what's really the evidence for what's happening around school health and school feeding? And um, that's uh, and, and, and development of school children. And, and, and that's reflected here. So what I'm going to be talking about are, is the basis is based on that evidence, not based on any individual opinion. One of the remarkable things um, that we discovered when we began asking these questions was that we don't really have commonly used words to describe the age groups we're interested in. Um, this, is, uh, this, is, this is looking at uh, the early, early years of life. Um, so this is looking at birth through the 20s. Um, and we can see that during those first 8,000 days of life, um, we have used lots of terms to, de to describe people, but one of the terms we miss out on is what we call children who are between five and nine years of age. Um, one of the, what, what we discovered was that the, the psychologists um, in particular had a term. They, they talk about this as middle childhood. It's the period, the period after um, the first five years. Um, it's, the first, it's the first five years in school and before, before adolescence. Um, and what I want to really focus on is both middle childhood and early adolescence in, in, uh, in our conversation today. So let's think about this as a dynamic process. This is a graph that asks questions about development over the first 20 years of life. So all three of these graphs, their x-axis are the first 20 years, zero to 20. Um, the graph at the top is a graph that looks at what happens to height during that period of time. And, you know, it's quite dramatic when you, when you look at it. First of all, we're growing throughout those first uh, 20, 20 years. We grow very quickly during when we're first born. Uh, so in the first thousand days, dramatic increases. Um, but still, we consistently grow throughout that period. And then during adolescence, show these remarkable adolescent or pubescent growth spurts, um, where, where children may grow as quickly as they last did when they were two. So there's a really very dramatic kick up in the, in, in the laying down of biomass and the strengthening of bones, all of which is going on at the same time, of course, as all the, the development of sexual, secondary sexual characteristics and all the things that we recognize as being what happens at puberty and how we change um, to, become, uh, to become young adults. Um, and these are dramatic changes, and yet we, we hardly think about this in, in the way in which we intervene in populations. Think of the biomass changes that happen at that age. Um, so clearly there's a, an important, I'm just using that as a very clear example of vulnerability at a particular age where we don't plan to do anything very special. And then 
the bottom two graphs are the fruits of the last 15 years of research that have completely changed the way we think about the brain development. I, when I was a kid, no, when I was a student, <laughs> which even that is long ago, when I was a student, I was taught that children were born with big heads because the brain was pretty well cooked by the time we were born. It was pretty well there. And it turns out that's true in terms of biomass. But from that early start, from those first thousand days, there's also dramatic changes throughout the first 20 years of life. And what these graphs show is that different parts of the brain change over those, those 20 years of life. And if we particularly look around from 10 years onwards, and as shown in the bottom graph, there are some parts of the brain that, that, that expand and some that actually shrink. There are some parts of the brain that, that uh, become heavily myelinated, so messages move much more quickly. And there are some parts of the brain where there's synaptic pruning to actually shorten the message lengths. So dramatic changes and all these, these things we say about uh, um, adolescence, all these behavioral ch changes we see about in adolescence are in fact related to these physical changes. There's, there are real body changes that go on um, that we're perhaps not as familiar with as, as, we, uh, as, as, we, as we should have been. And so all of this builds us into a picture that there are big changes after the first thousand days. Let's look at this now from a sort of more policy uh, point of view. The first thousand days are just as essential and important as we always said they were in terms of nutrition intervention and, and, and other interventions. Um, that's when maternal um, intrauterine growth and uh, infant growth and development are very important. But what we've failed to realize previously is that the next 7,000 days also require high levels of investment and care. We need to maintain those early gains, otherwise they, they do disappear, they do wash out. We need to also, for some children who haven't had the early opportunities, provide the opportunities for catch up. And you can see particularly during uh, pu puberty, there can be dramatic uh, catch up. And finally, there are very vulnerable phases themselves, the, the brain development phases being a fine example of, of that. And so what this, what this leads to is, is the idea that we have a a, a rather different paradigm that we think about development over the first 20 years of life, the first 8,000 days of life, um, as having a first thousand days, which is, which is absolutely crucially um, important, but also that there's then another 7,000 days where we need to pay far more attention than we have been doing um, uh, uh, up, up till now. And, what is, it we're, what is it we're actually doing now? What is it we're finding? Well, this is the, the analysis. And I'm, again, I, the, the, I, don't, uh, I don't apologize for having some numbers here. This is, again, as I stress, World Bank, um, a World Bank publication that asks the question, these in, in low and lower, lower middle income countries, how much are we spending on children at different ages in the, uh, in, in the, uh, in the, in the lifespan? Well, under five years of age, we think that the spend is about $29 billion a year. This, again, this is just in low, low and lower middle income companies, $29 billion per year under the age of five on average. Once you go over the age of five, there's a really strange picture that emerges. First, that the, there is very substantial investment in education. That's, that's great to hear. Um, something like $210 billion a year it being spent on education. Education switches on around the age of five and carries on uh, through around 20. Um, but are we in the health and nutrition area providing similar levels of support? No, very far from it. So probably the average amount being spent in, in children over five is around four billion, four billion a year. So a dramatically smaller number than, than is being spent on, on education. Um, I'm not arguing, and I just want to make this clear, I'm not arguing that the same amount should be spent on over fives as under fives. That's, that's almost certainly not the case. Um, but we are underspending. We are missing out on the opportunity to leverage all that investment in education. Children need investing in food and growth at the same time uh, as, as, as we're trying to provide them with, a, uh, with an education when we're trying to teach them. And, this becomes crucially important if we think about this in terms of the World Bank's human capital 
index. Um, this is the, um, a, an index that was launched two years ago that looks at the, at the capacity of a population to contribute to the wealth of their nation. It's also a measure of the population uh, growth as individuals, development as, as individuals. Um, and the, the graph here shows for, for many countries, the, um, Africa is in, in uh, orange here, uh, the rest of the world uh, shown in black, um, showing, showing that Africa is, is at lower than, uh, than the rest of the world in, in all of this. Um, and what this is showing that is that the countries on, on the right that have highest, uh, the richest countries, if you like, um, have the highest human capital index and those on the left have the, have the lowest. Uh, but what's striking is the difference. So in rich countries, it turns out that people create about 70% of the wealth. 70% of the wealth of those countries is, of rich countries, is attributed to the people. Whereas in poor countries, only 30 to 40% of, of the wealth. What does that mean? It means, first of all, that the, 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 the value of the population is not coming through in terms of, 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 of life, in terms of investment in the country, the, the, the returns to the country aren't there. And secondly, much more tragically, is that the individuals in that country are not achieving their full potential. It means that, the, that, that we're not investing enough in the development of the, of the population. And, and clearly that combination of good education and good health and nutrition is what's needed to, uh, to make that happen. And we can see that that's not happening in, in a lot of places. So the, um, the basic message then was that there was a real importance in investing in school aged children um, and what are the actions we should take and, and what's the role of the school in, in, in those things for hap to happen. So this is just a, a quick summary of schools as a, as a platform. Um, you know, it's good for access. It's excellent for, uh, chief, for delivering health and, health and nutrition and also excellent for education. So no question about the, uh, the value of the school. Um, this is just a, a sort of illustration of how all those things come together um, at the school. This was produced by, uh, uh, the, as part of the focusing resources on um, e e effective school health, the, the uh, UNESCO led initiative uh, 20 years ago. Um, and just to say now, uh, 20 years later, UNESCO has again produced a, a coalition around uh, uh, school health and nutrition. So just reinforcing amongst all of the agencies the importance of this. Um, here's a, a list of the kind of interventions that include school feeding um, that can be delivered through, through, through schools. And so these are the, uh, um, uh, those are the pictures. Just to finish on, on, on that, I want to say, let's realize that although school feeding often seems a very uh, a relatively exp more expensive program than some of the other programs it's uh, it has very high benefits very high returns um, in our analysis we show that school feeding is cost effective and it's cost effective on its own in terms of human capital but it has collateral benefits that that are also very important it has benefits for social protection benefits for the rural economy um, and benefits for um, less uh, substantial, less, uh, less clear, but nevertheless vitally important areas such as peace building. So we end up with very substantial school uh, feeding programs in many countries. I just chose the example here of Brazil to, to say that Brazil reaches more than 40 million students, um, which is a, a, a substantial example, one that many of us uh, follow. Um, but I also borrowed some, uh, um, some slides from Sharika uh, from our the World Food Programme team in, in India, uh, just to emphasize that India is so far ahead of anywhere, any other country, more than double the size of any other country programme. When we say it's the largest in the world, it's not largest by a small margin. Um, and that if we, in thinking about that programme, here are the, the, the characterized reasons for the programme, that it's about improving nutrition, um, but it's also about poor children. It's also about um, education. It's also about nutritional support in the most vulnerable during summer vacations. 
In other words, that this idea of multiple benefits from school feeding is very much encompassed in the way, uh, in the thinking uh, around the India school feeding program. What's, what's missing from this list is, is the agricultural um, returns, which I, which I guess are very substantial uh, too. So I've made, made some of the case for school feeding. Now let me make the case, so I made the case for, I should say, for school health and nutrition, including school feeding. And now I want to talk about what happened when COVID arrived. 192 countries closed their schools, one and a half billion, billion children uh, no longer had access to education, 368 million children were no longer being fed, um, and some 400 million were no longer benefiting from some programs like the, the National Deworming Day. Um, there was, it was a major change, a major uh, catastrophe for these children of school age. Um, and this was uh, done, the closing of the schools was done, of course, to try and reduce the, uh, the transmission level. Um, this is a World Food Program uh, map. These are all online. You can, you can check out the latest ones um, showing, uh, showing the, that this is a global, a global phenomenon, um, including in the very poorest and most needy countries. But what is the impact of COVID on school-aged children? You know, this has been, uh, been something that people have been trying to understand for some time, um, you know, for, for a short time, we've only been around for a short time, but it's been a, a focus of, of research and we really start now to, to, to begin to be clear on this. Children appear to have very few direct health consequences of COVID. In fact, a paper just published uh, today um, says that the, the risk of mortality in children is vanishingly small. I think the, 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 the number of deaths recorded throughout the whole epidemic in, in the UK is, I think, three in, in, in primary school children. And in, in South Africa, where they have a significant epidemic, I think it's seven out of 10 million children. So it's, you know, the, the, the differences are, are that it, it really is extremely low risk relative to all other risks. It's clear that, that car accidents are far more likely to kill children than, 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 than COVID. Um, what's the, uh, um, the role of children in transmission? Well, it does look as though that, that's, that that role is actually very small indeed, that the, that the uh, that children play little role in transmission between themselves, but also little role in transmission to adults, to their teachers, for example. And that picture, which, which we don't quite understand because, you know, with influenza, of course, it's the schools that drive the epidemic. That's certainly not at all the case with, uh, uh, with COVID. Um, and so the picture builds up that the closure of schools doesn't, or doesn't obviously have benefits for the children themselves, nor necessarily for the, the epidemic. And there's a great deal of interest now in, in a back to school movement, because of course, the consequences of school closure are themselves very grave. The longer children are out of school, particularly marginalized children, the less likely they are to return, particularly girls. Um, and that being out of schools, in, I'm, I'm now taking a global view, um, is associated with, with many increased risks, particularly in, in areas of Africa, the risks of early marriage, early pregnancy and of abuse um, are associated um, with, uh, with being out of school. Um, there is also always the risk that children who are out of school will be used inappropriately in terms of child labour. Um, uh, and of course, then there's the bigger issue for the child, the child herself, that of poor educational attainment, lack of education, and therefore lower future earnings and poor future career prospects. So there's a real negativity in children being out of school. Um, um, it's very hard to see advantages to the children in this, in, in, in this situation. And so what has been the initial response? The initial response has been for many countries to um, adapt their programs to mitigate the effects. Um, so on, on the one hand, providing education outside the school through distance learning, um, particularly online, that's far and away, I think 60 or 70% of countries are doing online education. Um, and then using TV and media as a, other alternatives. Um, but this is uh, really challenging and indeed fails the vulnerable 
So the digital divide, which we used to talk about a lot, turns out it's very real. Only some 10% of children in Africa, for example, have access to online education. So the, that's a, a real problem. And of course, it's worse where parental education levels are already low. So this locks families into a vicious cycle of, of uh, uh, poverty, breeding poverty. Um, and then similarly, on, on, in terms of the food and nutrition and safety net side of, of, of these programs that we've now stopped um, and replaced them with cash transfers or with take home rations, the big issue with both of those is that whether they reach the children or not. Um, and by and large, we know that they reach the family broadly and particularly the male heads of households, but they don't reach the vulnerable. So this is, the, there are big issues all, and, and all, many countries have made incredibly strong responses to provide some sort of intermediate uh, effect. I mean, this is again WFP data, um, some 71 countries worldwide have brought in um, alternative uh, solutions um, uh, the most common of which uh, in 43 countries is take home rations. Um, but none of these work anything like as well as, uh, as, as the school based programs. I think even in, in the World Food Programs, program that they manage themselves, they're only reaching a half of the, uh, despite enormous efforts, reaching half of the children uh, through these alternative approaches. So, what the action is now, and I don't know if any of you joined the uh, the, the webinar yesterday, which is chaired by UNESCO with the World Bank and with UNICEF, um, what's happening now is, is hurry up. The big message is let's get back to school. That countries are in now in a hurry to get their children back to school and avoid the harm caused by school closures. Um, and a UNICEF survey announced yesterday showed that 63 uh, countries have already reopened their schools, 55 have set the date to do that, um, and another 39 are in the planning phases uh, for that. But let's be very clear, what needs to happen to reopen schools is we need to make sure that these hungry children um, are drawn into the schools and the parents see the reasons to send the children to schools. And that takes us back to the first part of my talk this morning, that the incentive, one of the big incentives that we can offer is school health and nutrition programs and the school feeding program is a key way both of making sure the children get the nutrition but also of, of bringing them back into into the school so um, to finish up uh, I'm, I'm sure that, that we'll be sharing this uh, this slide presentation there's a number of, uh, of, of documents about technical guidance that's available in this area um, there's also a new partnership between UNICEF and the World Food Programme that's very specifically working um, on, on helping make, uh, make back to school happen in a, in a very structured way. So that's, uh, those are the messages I wanted to, to give you. Um, let's use this COVID crisis, let's use this COVID crisis to build back better the school systems. Let's use it to end the neglect of health and nutrition during uh, middle childhood. And, and what I've spoken about is, is the need for nutrition interventions <coughs> not just in the thousand, first thousand days, but throughout the 8,000 days, um, that, that we are currently neglecting that. We don't need to. Let's use the crisis to, to change that. Let's use schools to change that. Um, and that let's see the COVID-19 pandemic as a positive in encouraging us to build back better and, and create systems that really support our children. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Bundy. Uh, that was really insightful and, and also very personal, uh, as you shared, as a COVID survivor and the fact that you're still championing, you know, going strong and participating in so many of these sessions is uh, truly an inspiration and we take a lot from there. I do see a lot of questions coming in, uh, but we're going to wait until the Q&A session and move right into our next speaker. Um, Dr. Sharika Yunus, who's going to be presenting a landscape on uh, the state government responses to COVID uh, and midday meals response in India. A uh, little bit about uh, Dr. Yunus. She is the head of nutrition and school feeding unit at WFP India. A medical doctor by training, Dr. Sharika has been a public health practitioner for about two decades now. 
She has worked extensively on health and nutrition issues in India and in the South Asia region. Previously, uh, she used to also be the focal point for nutrition at uh, World Health Organization in India. Dr. Yunus, uh, I'm sure is no stranger again to the nutrition and school feeding community, particularly in India. What many of you might not know is that she's also a gold medalist in uh, community medicine. Um, she has to accredit several research papers in various national and international journals. Her main areas of interest are maternal and child health, infant and young child feeding, and links between disease and nutrition. Uh, I pass it on to my colleague, uh, Dr. Sharika Yunus, who's going to lead us through. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks a lot, Mamta, for that very kind introduction. Um, without further ado, uh, I'll perhaps delve directly into the presentation. And thanks a lot to Professor Bundy for setting me up uh, because he's, he's talked a lot about the school meals program, the importance of it. He's touched on the midday meal program in India, and then he's also touched upon the impact of COVID-19 on the school meals program. Um, I'll be taking the discussion a bit further and talking about uh, how has the COVID-19 impacted the school meals program or the midday meals program as we better know it in India. Um, so let's firstly, as, as most of the Indian participants uh, would be aware, but more for the benefits of participants who join from outside India, the school meals program or the midday meal program is a part of the National Food Security Act, which therefore makes the midday meal as a part of a rights-based approach and it makes it an entitlement. Therefore, national and state governments cannot shy away from not providing a midday meal to school children. Uh, so keeping that overall perspective into consideration, uh, what we've seen is that the national government, the Ministry of Education and the national government, has been particularly active in terms of issuing guidance and guidelines on keeping the midday meal program operational even during COVID times. The first guideline came from the Ministry of Education on the 20th of March, which was just about when the country was going into lockdown 1.0, asking the states to continue to provide midday meals in schools or to provide dry rations or to provide a a cooking cost or a food security allowance, which should cover the cost of the grains as well as the conversion cost and should be directly credited to the accounts of the beneficiaries. Uh, there was further a guidance which was issued on the 29th of April, which basically again asked the states to continue to provide the midday meals even during the summer vacations. Usually, uh, under normal circumstances, unless there's a drought or there's an emergency, the midday meals are not provided during the summer vacations. But looking at the impact of uh, COVID on um, the food and nutrition security, the government decided to continue with the provision of the midday meals, this time even during the summer vacations. And then you have further guidelines which were issued during the states in July as well as in August. And what we can take away from these guidelines is that there's been a very proactive response from the government of India at the national level. They've been watching the development of the situation on the ground, and they've been responding accordingly in terms of corrective measures. What you also see is that over a period of time, there's been a gradual nudge and encouragement to the states to actually move towards the provision of a nutritious food basket also asking the states to actually, instead of transferring the cooking cost, to ensure um, the provision of pulses as well as oils. Now, let's take a moment to see how all of that guidance from the national level has translated at the states. Um, and before we discuss that, let me just say that as World Food Program, we've been monitoring the MDM COVID-19 response from early March. We monitor it on a monthly basis. However, our monitoring is limited to desk reviews. It's limited to engaging with our staff where we have on-ground presence, engaging with staff from UNICEF uh, where they have presence. And in cases where nine, none of us have presence, we've reached out to government stakeholders. So if we look at um, the number of states which are distributing dry rations out of the 36 states and union territories that we have in the country, about 10 of them are distributing dry rations. 
There are about 21 states and union territories in the country who are distributing a mix of dry ration and the cooking cost. There are about two uh, union territories, primarily Chandigarh and Delhi, which are only distributing a food security allowance, but covering the cost of the grains. Um, and despite our best intentions and a lot of efforts, uh, we do not have information for about three states. Um, and therefore we cannot comment whether uh, the information is because there's no information available, lack of information is because there's no information available in the public domain or perhaps because the MDM is not functional. Uh, so we cannot really comment on that. Um, and the status that I've presented to you here is the status uh, latest of the 15th of August. Uh, COVID is a very dynamic situation and therefore they may have, uh, things may have changed and in case things may have changed and are not appropriately reflected here, my apologies to the states. Um, let's also take a moment to understand how is it that the 31 states were distributing dry rations? What are the sort of modalities that they are adopting? Uh, so the usual modality or the predominant modality that we see is most of the states and union territories are asking for the parents of the school children to come to the schools and collect the rations. Um, then there are another number of states, nine to be precise, where um, the state is doing a doorstep delivery to the homes of the school children. Um, there are about three states in the country where there's a mix, there's no uh, let's say there's no decided modality or there's no decisive modality. At times there's direct doorstep delivery which is happening and at times uh, the rations are being delivered through the schools. And then there are another set of three states which are leveraging uh, and other food-based safety nets and I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, they're leveraging the last point of delivery of an alternate food-based safety net to deliver the rations to the school children. Um, the alternate food-based safety net that I'm referring to is the targeted public distribution system. The targeted public distribution system is by far the largest food-based safety net that we have in the country. Uh, it delivers a household food ration and it covers about 800 million of us um, under the scheme. Um, just to show you also the variety of food baskets and the states which are represented here are in no particular, there's no particular rationale around it. We've just picked up states from different parts of the country to try and show the various food baskets which are distributed. And as you can see, the food baskets vary from just grains to some states which have tried to uh, look at it from a more nutritional perspective and therefore have added more nutritious products to it. There are some states uh, which have added condiments and pulses and oils, et cetera, to, uh, to the food baskets. So there's really a large variety of food baskets which is out there. Um, again, uh, this is just primarily from our perspective as to what are some of the best practices that we see in the MDM COVID response across the country. Uh, the MDM, as we all know, is primarily limited to school children studying in government schools between grades one to eight. Uh, some states looking at the food and nutrition impact of the pandemic have gone ahead and included children studying in grade 9 and 10. Um, there are some states who have uh, supplemented the food baskets with additions of soaps and sanitizers as a part of the preventive measures against COVID. There are some states which have looked at the food response and tried to see as to how they can make it pilferage free and leakage free. Uh, case in points being Odisha and Gujarat. Uh, and they've tried to have a very systematic manner in, of distribution through vouchers or through leverage of the fair price shops. Um, then there are other states which have added a nutritious product such as Dadra, Nagar Haveli and Daman and Diu, where they've made, um, added a nutritious product called Sukri, which is basically um, a, a blended food consisting of wheat flour, jaggery and ghee. Uh, just some glimpses of the distribution of the dry ration in different parts of the country. Uh, with that, um, I think now we can move into the next part of our webinar, which is engaging a bit more with the states and trying to delve into uh, especially the COVID response for, of three states, which is Odisha, Uttar Pradesh and Meghalaya, and to try and understand how they have um, uh, sort of mounted the response, what are some of 
the challenges that they have faced, what are some of the issues in learnings, et cetera, that they have. Uh, with this, I hand it back to my colleague, Mamta, who will now introduce the panelists, and then I come in with some questions once the presentations by the panelists are over. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sharika, for that very insightful uh, landscape. And, uh, you know, no matter uh, how small an Indian state uh, program is, it's still larger than many of our uh, participants that are tuned in and the countries they represent. So there's a, definitely a lot of learning. Uh, so uh, I would like to invite all of our distinguished panelists. Um, we were supposed to have four states, uh, but Andhra Pradesh colleague is not able to join uh, because of personal uh, matters that have come up. But regardless, we do have representatives from the state of Odisha, from the state of uh, Meghalaya, and as well as uh, from the state of Uttar Pradesh. Uh, so without ado, uh, let me do a quick introduction. Uh, the state of uh, Odisha is represented by Mr. Gangadhar Sahu. Mr. Sahu is a senior member in the State Administrative Service. He's the nodal officer of the school feeding program in uh, Odessa, with nearly three decades of experience in the fields of revenue, disaster management, general administration, development, nutrition, and education. Mr. Sahu is also currently responsible for the teachers' training and educational research in Odessa. He's a known columnist with rational views. He's also a keen learner and a reformist with interest in ensuring accountability and transparency through technology in the domain of his responsibilities. He strongly believes education get people all the need and promotes an education for all, especially children. And we've also had the pleasure of working with uh, Mr. Sahu in, uh, in several capacities. So we're really delighted to have him on. Um, we will also be joined by Mr. Ambrose uh, Marak, who represents Meghalaya. Mr. Marak is the Director of School Education and Literacy and the Director of Higher and Technical Education. Uh, Mr. Marak, uh, for perspectives today particularly, I, I'm uh, quite excited because not only will it shed light on the MD, uh, the midday meals of uh, Meghalaya, but in a broad sense, I think it will allow, allow us to gain some familiarity with the Northeastern uh, Indian states and the uniqueness uh, that the region brings. And uh, finally, the panel will be uh, led by Mr. Mumtaz Ahmed, uh, representing the government, the state government of Uttar Pradesh. Uh, Mr. Ahmed is the finance controller of the Midday Meal Authority of the government of Uttar Pradesh. Uh, UP, as we know, is the most populous state of India with a population of, of an estimated uh, 200 million. Uh, and uh, clearly uh, also runs one of the largest uh, school feed-in uh, by virtue of the state numbers and uh, the students that are encompassed within. So there's a lot to be learned. Uh, I turn it over to my colleague Sharika, uh, who leads this uh, presentation and uh, the plenary discussion. Thank you. Over to you, sirs. Um, thanks a lot, Mamta. Over to you, Mr. Sahu. Sorry, we sort of overshot the time, but I'm sure uh, your presentation will be very insightful for all of us. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Mamta, for your wonderful introduction of mine. It was also a great privilege to get educated uh, by the presentation of Mr. Donald Bundy. He made a very wonderful uh, presentation of international perspective of school feeding program. Even Sharika did the same thing from Indian perspective. And uh, let me <clears throat> tell you, I was hearing Mr. Donald Bundy, uh, who was talking of uh, investment in learning and learner. Actually, it influenced me a lot. I was thinking about that. Really, you need to work on that because I am uh, working in the sector of education and nutrition. Definitely, we have to think a lot about that and uh, uh, reallocate and re-budget everything. Okay, we'll, uh, uh, I'd like to take all of you uh, through the slides that we have prepared and uh, uh, sent to you. Okay, let me go to the first slide. Yeah, with regard to this uh, COVID-19, this uh, pandemic 
has uh, changed the whole scenario it has changed all walks of human life not to talk of education and health only but when uh, you mention disaster yes i was also working as a general manager in the disaster management but odisha disaster is not new to odisha odisha is also not new to disaster and for the information of all let me tell you in odisha we first put up odisha disaster management authority after the super cyclone and thereafter we have tried a lot to face the disaster up front and tackle it yeah, i mean in maybe it is a cyclone flood or whatever maybe the natural calamity and when this covid 19 came it is another disaster of unforeseen nature and you know in india actually there was one act called uh, epidemic diseases act 1897 that means it is uh, free independent india free independent era when india was under the british rule that act was passed and thereafter it was not thought of changing that act but it is covid 19 which moved government of india to bring out some amendment and the epidemic diseases amendment ordinance 2020 was made and it made covid 19 the national disaster and accordingly government of india and all the state governments they actually prepared themselves to face this disaster and in odisha particularly we marched ahead we closed all the schools with effect from 13th march and uh, we wanted to protect the health of the children first then we'll talk of education and we did that and we are right now doing that also then when you think of the health and education of the children we have to think of the whole family also so government of india is working in tandem i mean all the departments there are three to four departments who are essentially working like health department education department then the food security department all of them are working in tandem with one another and they are doing wonderful jobs to contain this and manage this covid 19 second slide yeah when i uh, tell you that other departments are also working yes to fight this covid 19 and manage it both dry ration and hot food food are provided government of odisha had made arrangement of of covid care home or the quarantine centers where the uh, covid positive patients they are being isolated and all i mean food health sanitation facilities are made available so free hot cooked food is available in all the covid care centers and the quarantine centers but with regard to the food security the targeted pds public distribution system department education department and the department dealing with the nutrition immunization and education another department they all are working and they have also provided a dry ration at the doorstep of the beneficiary next slide when we talk of uh, midday meal pre covid situation Midday meal is a wonderful scheme actually. As uh, my previous panelist uh, rightly pointed out, it is the largest school feeding program of the world, right? In Odisha also, it is the largest school feeding program of our state. Vis-a-vis -vis the school feeding program run by 
uh, the icds department and this uh, program is interesting because it attracts the children to the school it reduces the uh, gender gap it removes the prejudices with regard to the religion caste class etc etc and to i mean on the top of everything i am happy to announce that in odisha this uh, mid day meal has been considered as the legal food right of every child legal food right of every child under nfsa act government of odisha has brought out one rule that is called odisha mid day meal rule so every child who is going to the school is entitled to mid day meal so it is a legal food food right and uh, here in odisha we have around 57000 schools across the state i mean both coastal region hill region and other parts of odisha and all the areas are covered under mid day meal next so when we uh, discuss about the mid day meal management during covid 19 pandemic first we are at uh, a fix to proceed how to proceed how to i mean address this issue of mid day meal can we give them a hot cooked meal if not then what actually hot cooked meal uh, was not possible because the children were not allowed to come to the school and uh, even at the village level you cannot cook and serve at every uh, doorstep so it was uh, decided that we will give mid day meal i mean the dry ration to the beneficiary at the earliest and you know we thought of giving them at one go i mean for 90 days at one go we decided to give the dry ration and when we thought of doing that again the question came the security of the children because we can't ask the children to come and receive it so in odisha we decided that the parents or the guardians of the children would come and receive it so we i mean our school teachers they prepared the coupons at home and they delivered the coupons to the guardians at their doorstep and instead of coming to the school the guardians they went to the nearby pds outlet from where they collected the entitlements of their boys and girls the students so it actually uh, worked very well very transparently and very effectively we managed this and uh, almost 99% of the students were covered thank you next yeah. no yeah so by now almost 75000 metric ton of rice distributed 4030 billion rupees distributed i mean th this cash that is uh, the cooking cost amount so the food security allowance covers two parts one is uh, this uh, dry ration and the other part is the cooking cost from which they were purchasing eggs vegetable fuel uh, etc etc so the mid day meal dry ration was uh, handed over to the uh, parents or the guardians and the cooking cost was directly transferred to the account of the child or the account of the parents and uh, <clears throat> yeah in odisha two more things happened i'll tell i don't know whether it has happened in other parts of india i mean the non school working days whether they have covered or not i am not sure but in odisha government very consciously decided that will also cover the non school days non school working days under mid day meal also during this pandemic period especially 
so it has been covered and the summer vacation as sarika was telling it is also covered and here i will flag up one thing uh odisha is very particular about uh, this uh, transparency you will all be happy to know that we have a 5t model of governance here 5t model means technology team transparency then uh, uh, transformation all these things that are covered under so transparency is one pillar of our governance model so here what we have done we have asked another government of india research organization that is icmr indian council of medical research which bhubaneswar branch is here to go to the field and ascertain whether the children or the parents they have received their rightful entitlement or not this is we call the third party evaluation of the mid day meal management during this covid pandemic also and it has done and the icmr they have also furnished this third party study report and it has also reached the government by now next so this is how we uh, i mean managed from mid day meal uh, upfront during this pandemic the integration with the pds distribution of dry ration and uh, transfer of the cooking cost on the dvt mode and in this uh, i mean endeavor we have got assistance from world food program here also those who are, i mean in state branch they are actively participating then the icmr then the pds department all of them have rendered the requisite assistant collaboration and cooperation i am thankful to all of them and lastly i will also say that for the la i am here in the department for one decade so to say and i am receiving the requisite uh, cooperation from world food program and uh, nclf also and uh, i heartfully uh, thank the organizer and uh, uh, all the panelists for listening to me patiently and uh, i'll tell you that uh, for the way forward i mean we are looking forward to reopening of the schools and in this venture i am seeking the i mean support of world food program and unicef who are stationed in odisha bhubaneswar and we are coming out with an sop or the protocol of that sort so that very systematically and securely we will be reopening the school and resuming school feeding program in the befitting manner thank you all thank you very much uh thanks a lot mr sahu that was an excellent presentation and as always uh, you reflect the work that is being done in orissa under your leadership so well so thank you so much i do hope you'll be able to stay back for another 10 minutes um, i'll we'll go through the presentation from uttar pradesh and meghalaya and then have a little round of questions and answers so i do hope you'll be able to stay back for another 10 15 minutes uh with that let's move to the next presentation from the state uh may i request mr mumtaz ahmed who's the finance controller of the mid day meal authority government of uttar pradesh uh to kindly make his presentation over to you mumtaz sir thank you and good afternoon to you all presentation i understand you will be handling the slides yourself you will be moving the slides yourself right just a moment
हेलो हेलो यस यू आर ऑडिबल यू आर कंप्लीटली ऑडिबल सर प्लीज गो हेड as you are aware we are the highest number of we are having the highest number of schools highest number of students highest number of blocks gram sabha and highest number of even upkam helpers 1 lakh वन लाख एट्टी वन करोड़ चिल्ड्रेन आर एनरोल्ड इन आवर स्कूल दे आर आर सेवेंटी फाइव डिस्ट्रिक्स एट्टी एट हंड्रेड एट्टी एट एट्टी ब्लॉक्स वन पॉइंट सिक्स सेवन लाख स्कूल एंड टू प्रिपेयर हार्ट मील्स फॉर स्टूडेंट्स फाइव पॉइंट सेवन फाइव लाख को कम हेल्पर्स है Uh, 5.75 teachers are engaged and 3.78 lakh cooks has been engaged pre scenario is that hard cook meal is has is being served to the student present in the school days basically in general is cook is being prepared at the school level through to come helpers and very few districts are being served by ngos like achhapat and other small ngos mid day meal provided to the children on each school day as per weekly menu menu is has been decided by state government average number of student availing as you know 1 crore 2 lakh food grants as per norms given 100 grams per child per day for class 1 to 5 and 150 grams per child per day for class 6 to 8 accordingly cooking cost is also being provided 4.48 rupees per child per day class 1 to 5 and 6.71 per per class per day to 6 to 8 class students in addition 150 ml and 200 ml heart milk is provided on every wednesday to uh, respectively primary and upper primary school children one seasonal fruit is provided every monday from state budget due to covid 19 lockdown and summer vacation schools were closed from 24 3 march 2020 as per direction by the state government food security allowance is being provided to all 1.81 crore children enrolled in primary and upper primary school food grant provided for 76 has been calculated up to 30th june the process is also being uh, forwarded to uh, after uh, 30th june that is july and august the same process is being uh, followed 
पाथ जुलाई एंड अगस्त मंथ ऑल स्टूडेंट्स हैव बीन गिवन एन अथॉरिटी लेटर फॉर फूड ग्रेन्स 7.76 किलोग्राम पर चाइल्ड पर प्राइमरी स्कूल एंड 11.4 किलोग्राम पर चाइल्ड पर अपर प्राइमरी स्कूल similarly cooking cost has also been calculated and uh, distributed through their bank accounts either of uh, students or their guardians 374 per child primary school and 561 per child per upper primary school rate of cooking cost as by government of india has devised from april 4.97 per child per school and 7.45 per child per day per ups this has been taken into uh, considered for providing their conversion cost to the school children the conversion cost has been transferred through the uh, uh, direct benefit transfer by banks centralized database has been created for information regarding bank account details of school children or their parents through survey done by the teachers in a much more under provision of food security allowance the following measures are being undertaken transfer of cooking cost as per direct benefit transfer to the beneficiaries bank account through school by teachers issuance of authority letter to the beneficiaries for the collection of food from uh, food grant from kotidars through public distribution system an online matching system has been developed to monitor the distribution of food grant and cooking cost process of confirmation is also underway through ivrs calls the data as uh, i have said in the first point the centralized database has been created for information the uh, mobile numbers has also been taken from uh, the uh, teachers of uh, guardians or students whichever is available and ivrs call will be met to confirm that all the uh, uh, students has been benefited by their by food grant and conversion cost both whether they have received food grant through kotedar or whether uh, they have uh, any problem they can relieve they can reply also conversion cost is also being measured by uh, monitored by um, ivrs call have they got it or not the action will be taken after if ivrs call has been completed if uh, there is any problem 1.4 lakh metric ton food grain and 722 crores of cooking cost has been distributed to, to the beneficiaries in the, up to the 30th june additional fund 5 517 crores for conversion cost has been uh, uh, provided to the uh, children or their guardians and additional food grain in this period were 1 lakh 4000 metric ton and the state government is uh, going to is also thinking decided has decided to go through this process for july and august also and it will be continue after till the schools open in the meanwhile we will try to keep balance of food grains 
and the conversion cost in the school so that if the school opens the heart middle school heart middle school can be provided to the student thank you um thanks a lot mumta sir for uh, explaining so well uh, the response strategy adopted by the government of uttar pradesh uh, for distribution as well as for monitoring uh, the distribution of the midday meal um just for uh, reference of people who've joined from outside india if uttar pradesh were a state it would actually have the population if uttar pradesh in itself were a country the population of uttar pradesh would be equivalent to the population of brazil which is the fifth largest country in the world so just to give you a sense of um, uh numbers in in india and in general in uttar pradesh uttar pradesh is the most populous state in the country and therefore being able to run these food based safety nets in such populous states uh seamlessly and with quality means a lot um our last panelist uh from the state is mr ambrose he will represent the state of meghalaya and the response of the state of meghalaya on covid 19 vis a vis the midday meals over to you mr ambrose thank you dr sarika yunis for this opportunity to present the midday meal response in the state of meghalaya uh, very good afternoon to everyone and i feel fortunate to be uh, in the panel list uh, for discussion in the midday meal uh, project and the program in the state of meghalaya and the state government responses uh, pre covid and uh, during the covid Uh, Meghalaya is a very small state, about uh, 29 lakhs uh, population. Although Meghalaya is a very small state, the number of schools uh, we have in the state is uh, 14,700 school uh, education sector. Uh, this COVID-19 has been really affecting every walk of life, and it has. Uh, terribly affected the school children therefore along with the rest of the country the state government has also decided to provide uh, rations under the midday meal program uh, the state has about uh, yeah 11 number of uh, districts and subdivisions 15 and 46 number of uh, blocks and in all these uh, districts uh, number of uh, children covered is uh, about 6 lakhs and total of 11 uh, 1803 school have is being covered under midday uh, program now during this covid uh, uh, covid 19 many of the teachers have been deputed for covid duty to man the quarantine centers run by the a uh, community management system and many of the school teachers have been deputed to uh, for a poster campaign about the information uh, ict material on covid 19 therefore although despite of all these uh, duties assigned to the teachers uh, the state of meghalaya also has been able to provide the dry ration to the children who are affected by the covid 19 uh during uh before the covid 19 uh the state government was providing all the cooked meal uh, to the school children uh uh aspe the rate the specified by the ministry and every school cooked meal meat and meal was being served and all the cook come helpers were being provided with the renumeration uh with the nutritious food you know meghalaya uh, state is predominantly uh, children prefer to take rice therefore the state government uh, provides under midday program rice dal vegetable eggs and sometimes meat also chicken curry also is being provided to the children 
before the COVID uh, starts. Now, uh, midday meal in, uh, is being provided both for the government school, elementary schools, SSA schools, and other government-aided schools. And monitoring of implementation of this midday meal school uh, program was being instructed from time to time from the state government by the district school education officers, by the block resource center and sub inspectors and cluster resource center. And this food were being provided to the school children. Now, when the midday uh, COVID-19 has come, it has greatly affected all the movements in the state. Therefore, the state government during the COVID had decided to provide the dry rations through the school management committee and through the block resource center, cluster resource centers. And parents have been asked to come to the schools, to the community centers to collect the food grains as well as also cooking costs. Yes. Now, the responsibility of the state government during the COVID is that uh, the food grains to the parents have been provided. Uh, the cook, uh, cooking course has been provided to all the school managing committees and parents are directed to come and collect the uh, rations uh, from the respective schools. And the state government has very strictly instructed the inspecting staff of respective districts to do the monitoring that parents come to the children uh, to the school and if children uh, are also able to come to the school they are also asked to come to the school and give the rations in the respect to the respective school managing committee and the registers whatever detail payment detail distributions are being kept in the respective schools. Now I have some pictures of distribution of uh, these uh, food grains and other cooking uh, allowances uh, to the schools and their parents. So these are the pictures how the state government in the state Meghalaya is being carried out. It has been very difficult and challenging the time for the government and to run the schools and to monitor. However, state government is uh, along with the Ministry of Home Affairs, as soon as the, uh, it is allowed, all the schools will be uh, reopened. Maybe we don't know when the schools will be allowed to open. However, state government is taking steps and we will try our best uh, along with the rest of the country to implement that and to provide nutritious food to the school children as soon as the cook meal, as soon as the schools are reopened. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Ambrose. Thanks also for explaining to us um, the fact that the teacher, the school teachers are burdened with numerous activities during COVID and how despite that they've been able to keep the midday meal program running as per the guidance of the national government. Um, it was also very interesting to note the sort of ration that was distributed pre-COVID, which not only consisted of rice, dal, and vegetables and eggs, but also meat, uh, given the local and the cultural preference in the state. So thank you so much for sharing that experience. We now move on to a set of questions uh, that we have for the three state panelists. And if I could request all the three uh, state panelists to please switch on their cameras so that the audience um, can see you uh, while the questions are being asked. And my first um, question is actually to Mr. Sahu. Um, is, and the question that I have for you, sir, is uh, why was it thought appropriate to distribute food rations through the pair price shops rather than through schools or home delivery? Um, Mr. Sahu, please. 
Yeah. <clears throat> that was also your uh, query or your concern was also well debated uh, in the secretariat corridor and keeping in view the security and the proximity of the fair price shop to the beneficiary it was decided that uh, the passion would be distributed through the pds outlet number one number two to avoid the delay suppose from the school point would have decided to give then it would have taken some time uh, to transport it from the civil supply corporation then uh, made some arrangement then distributed but when it was decided to integrate with the tpds so it is a better mechanism and at one go the same household the same householder would come to receive the tpds and the mid meal entitlement from the same person same time so it was an integrated approach sure sir thank you so much and if i may just continue with the state of odisha and ask one more question um how quickly was the state government able to adapt their response to covid to ensure that children receive their food entitlements also if you could briefly take us through the process and the challenges faced uh, mr gangadhar sahu please yeah very good i see uh, immediately on 13th march government of odisha decided to uh, shut down the school okay and from 20th uh, march it was decided to give the mid day meal ration at one go that is for 90 days without any waiting for the approval of government of india before receipt of any order or any communication from government of india government of odisha decided to give the minimum entitlements out of its own budget subsequently it was endorsed and validated by government of india so we have decided much earlier and went ahead hmm. sure thanks thanks a lot sir um if i may now come to the representative from the state of uttar pradesh and perhaps ask the same question Uh, how quickly was the mdm authority in the state of uttar pradesh able to adapt uh, the covid response to ensure that children receive their food entitlement and if you can briefly take us through the processes and the challenges faced over to you mumtaz sir uh in uttar pradesh since uh, you know well we have the largest number of students large number of schools and hard could meals were could not be given provided if it was in the state government taken it in consideration and try to feed the students but hard could meal preparation and serving was very difficult nearly 10 lakh hands were needed to provide hard food meals so we discussed it in state government and also with mhrd and with the mhrd ultimately we decided with the consultation of the uh, mhrd we decided to provide food security allowances to all students and the process were uh, in stated in may in april and ultimately the uh, government ordered the in may to provide these facilities since we have discussed already all the points we initiated all things immediately the authority letter for food grain distribution and uh, data collection for the Uh, bank. bank transfer of uh, conversion cost initiated though it was order in last may but the process initiate uh, immediately started and we take it in the 
uh, we confirmed it in June to serve all the children. Sure, thank you so much, uh, sir, for uh, for explaining the process and also talking a bit about the challenges uh, that you thought through in in deciding the response of the state. Uh, may I now come to uh, Mr. Ambrose from the state of Meghalaya? Um, so the question that I have for you is, uh, can you share experiences of other emergencies that your state had to deal with in the disruption of the midday meal program? And how did those experiences prepare you uh, for dealing with the current pandemic? Mr. Ambrose? Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, see, uh, we had a, a very good uh, collaboration with the district magistrates. Uh, there are 11 uh, districts and we had a very good connections with all the district uh, magistrates in the district. And uh, with regard to the distribution and uh, uh, of the food grains, we uh, tie up with the uh, food and civil supply set department, PDS system, and we ask the district, respective district magistrates, uh, to deliver the food grants to the doorsteps of the schools. And in that way, we are able to cover all the schools. And as soon as the food grants are delivered to the doorsteps uh, of the schools, the respective teachers along with the school management committee, they coordinate with the parents and then they are able to distribute the uh, food grants and the cooking costs to the uh, respective children. That is how we collaborate with the uh, district uh, magistrates in the respective districts. Uh, in the state capital in Shillong, the, the education department has been charged to look after the uh, COVID centers. Myself uh, has been charged to look after and run the uh, Corona Care Centers, uh, which is the biggest uh, Corona centers in the state of Meghalaya, which is about, uh, which is uh, numbering about uh, 258 beds, uh, beds uh, for the Corona positive cases in the state. So even in spite of all these uh, duties, uh, we have been able to response uh, uh, in respect of the delivery of the food grains to the uh, respective schools. Sure. Uh, Mr. Ambrose, did any other emergency in the past uh, in terms of floods or, or anything else prepare you for setting in place the sort of SOP that you just described to me? Um, yeah, we have the uh, emergency response uh, system. Uh, for example, in the uh, western part of Meghalaya, uh, uh, recently there has been a surge in flood where all the schools have been submerged and the schools, uh, uh, this midday meal distribution could not be done. However, with the help of the uh, public distribution system in the state, uh, place in system, we have been able to reach to the community halls, community centers, block resource, uh, uh, cluster resource centers. And that way we have been able to uh, deliver the food grants to those emergency flood affected areas. And how, uh, th that's how we cover to the flood affected uh, schools uh, in the regions. Sure. Um, just one more question to you, uh, Mr. Ambrose. Uh, MDM, the Midday Meal Program, uh, is often touted as the cornerstone of India's nutrition security. Uh, what kind of changes do you expect coming in in the scheme post-COVID? Uh, the um, in Meghalaya, uh, these uh, children they like to eat rice, and then uh, apart from rice. We provide the vegetables and meat uh, also is provided to the children. And if we could uh, increase the uh, increase the cooking costs uh, of uh, this conversion cost, whatever we call it, then children will have more access and and they will get more nutritious food uh, for the children. Therefore, uh, even the uh, even the cook come help us uh, honorarium which is given by the government of india is also 
as very, very less. Uh, we provide them only 1,000 rupees for all the Kukam helpers. Therefore, it is very difficult to get the Kukam helpers uh, in the schools also. However, with the collaboration of the self-help groups and community leaders, we are able to uh, give um, cook meal uh, to the children. Sure. Um, I'll now come back to Mumtaz, sir, um, and perhaps ask the same question that I asked Mr. Ambrose. Uh, the midday meal is uh, one of the important schemes as India's response to nutrition security. What are the sort of changes that you ex expect in the scheme post-COVID? Mumtaz, sir? Yeah. <clears throat> gotcha. Uh, uh, I'm just calling back, please. Yeah, we are we are doing a, a we are uh, we have made an uh, applications prana portal through Prerna portal and uh, we have registered all the, the school children's in on the portal we have taken in these in this process the account they all the details of uh, school children's their guardians like uh, aadhar number their um, uh, account number addresses and all the details linked with this so that we can uh, uh, proceed if it uh, goes longer or in any other situations if any other situation also arises we can uh, provide them food security allowances through bank direct benefit transfer to their banks and the process has been initi initiated these uh, for the uh, previous uh, previous months, uh, the distribution of the distribution of food grants through Kotedas, it can be continued uh, further till the schools are being opened. Sure, sir. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mamta. We have time for another two questions, hopefully. Uh, we, Sharika, I think we should also get to the audience uh, questions. There are quite a few that have come in. Um, should we jump to that? And if there's time, then go back to the uh, to the questions, the other questions. Would that be okay? And I think we can also bring in uh, Professor Bundy because there are there are a number of questions that are directed to him. Perfect. So um, yeah. I'll hand the floor now back to you for the audience questions, and then um, there are still two questions that I would Great. like to and, ask. And uh, Professor Bundy, can we also? Great. Sure. No, I was just saying that I'll hand it to you now to do the Q&A with the audience. Um, and then if we can come back, there are two interesting questions that I have for the state level representative. So if there is time, then we'll perhaps move to those two questions. So back to you now. Thank you. And uh, we do thank everyone for the time you've given. Uh, please hang in another 15 minutes or so. Uh, uh, there are some interesting questions that have come up. Uh, maybe we can start uh, with this uh, first, which is directed uh, to Professor Bundy. Uh, the question is a bit, a bit long, so I don't know how to synthesize, but let me try. Uh, when 1,000 days concept is building up in India, where we know a large number of young mothers of uh, children are also underweight and anemic, would it be not worthwhile to evolve strategy of 1,000 days uh, nutrition care of mothers too. Uh, malnourished mothers fail to provide optimum nutrition care. Uh, mother's nutrition except pregnancy and first month of PNC is not focused. Uh, similarly, in this, uh, I think there are two questions where you can take together, uh, it, it fits the theme. The second one is, uh, so the first question was from uh, Mr. Vikas Desai. Uh, we have uh, Shalvi Shah also along the same veins. Uh, she writes how this life cycle approach can be brought into the nutrition scheme of India, taking into consideration that India has two separate schemes, one for zero to four years, and then the other one 
from uh, four to 14 years. That's the midday meals that we're talking about largely today uh, with no convergence between these two schemes. Um, so Professor Bundy, if you can just throw some light on these questions, uh, primarily which is looking at asking about the life cycle approach and the convergence. Sure, thank you for uh, bringing me back into the conversation. Um, yeah, first of all, I should say that my comments on, will not be about India, because as I've said, there are people much better are able to answer questions about India on this panel. Um, but let me take this as a general, some of these things as a general question. You, you mustn't interpret anything I said as indicating that we shouldn't be doing more for children under, uh, under five years of age. The first thousand days clearly is the crucial period initial period in growth. My, my uh, argument, the arg not my argument, the argument that's being presented in the 8,000 days paradigm is that, the, um, that in addition to those investments, we need to think much more carefully about investing in school children. And of course, that investment includes investing in adolescents and adolescents particularly who are going to become mothers so a big part of what this, uh, this argument is about is ensuring that young women, that the health and nutrition of young women is specifically targeted and specifically uh, protected so that uh, going into pregnancy, when the young women become uh, wives and mothers, um, the, uh, going into pregnancy that they are physiologically ready um, for, for that. And so it, it's a life cycle approach in that it is also talking about the next generation. And so there's absolutely the, the question, questioner is correct. Of course, there needs to be a very good emphasis on maternal health as part of this overall picture. Um, but that's my argument was not that we should be doing less on maternal health or less on, on, on the thousand days, but that we, we, we really do need to give much more focus in addition to the next 7,000 days. So that's really the, uh, the main part of the story. Um, the, second, the second part of the question, which was about the two separate schemes uh, in, in India regarding nutrition, uh, that's really, I think, a, an internal discussion that needs to perhaps happen to, to think about um, what are the different stages that are important uh, to target uh, throughout life? The first thousand days, of course, what are the other phases that uh, subsequently that need to be targeted as well? And then, of course, what's the what's the optimal way of dealing with that? You know, many people would argue, for example, that the first that the thousand days really can't be very well dealt with through schools, uh, but that the next uh, seven thousand days really can. So there may be a very good argument for you for in terms of implementation using different approaches. Um, but as I said at the beginning, there are people on this panel who clearly have far more experience, um, who have real experience on uh, implementation um, in the context of, of the Indian populations. I hope, that, uh, I hope that answers the question, Mamta. Please feel free thank to you. ask me a Absolutely. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe what we can do is switch it over to our, uh, our speakers from the three state representatives that we have. If, uh, you wanted to address the same question uh, in the India context. So looking at the convergence of uh, the life cycle approach of nutrition. Anyone, Mr. Mr. Mumtaz, Mr. Sahu, Mr. Marak, would you like to take, would you like to respond to those questions? Yes, so Ms. Mumtaz, uh, the questioner is right about the convergence of the two schemes that is uh, 1,000 and 7,000 days. Right now in India, particularly in Odisha, one department, they are looking after the Anganwadi children and another department is looking after the school children. Both of them are doing this uh, nutrition work. But in view of the National Education Policy 2020, now it is being converged. It will come under one umbrella. Okay, number one. Number two, with regard to the menu and uh, the calorie content, protein, etc., 
द सेम गवर्नमेंट डिसाइड इट एंड आज मिस्टर डोनाल्ड बंडी राइटली सेड अंडर द टू स्कीम्स बोथ द चिल्ड्रेन एंड द मदर देयर हेल्थ हाइजीन एंड न्यूट्रिशनल सिक्योरिटी इज बींग टेकन केयर ऑफ थैंक यू Anybody else wants to tackle that question? If not, there are uh, there are quite a lot of queries that have come. We can move on. Uh, this one again, I go back to Professor Bundy. Uh, says, uh, and I think a little bit of. Can I tell something? Oh, Mr. Ahmed, please, please go ahead. Uh, as uh, Mr. Gangadhar told, in the uh, whole country, I think. Uh, there is uh, another department uh, who takes the care of uh, mothers and uh, infant children in state of up there is there are anganwadi karkarti who take care the of the infant children in uh, every villages and mostly centers are and their centers are established in schools in state of up now state government has is uh, deciding has decided and we can say that we, it has been finalized maybe order uh, is may be issued in few days that uh, we are uh, concerning the pre schooling we are thinking we are deciding to for the pre schooling that means that uh, uh, children uh, at before uh, lower age of 5 can be given pre schooling and agan bodies are being uh, planned to train for uh, uh, schooling uh, for teaching them along with this in every district in up all this in all in 75 districts we are planning to develop a kitchen garden for a nutritional for providing nutritional food to children and uh, even few uh, schools uh, where the uh, space are available we are planting medicinal plants also for the uh, uh, use of to use uh, for the use of the children's or even can be used in villages also so we are uh, we are doing these things thank you thank you for uh, throwing some more light there uh, mr marak would you like to also make any uh, yes. response to that particular question please go ahead uh, yes uh, there are two departments uh, one is education and one is a uh, women and child department this two department handles uh, uh, mother mother care and the uh, mid day meal program is covered by the uh, education department now with the coming of the new education policy this uh, pre schooling and the primary lower primary will be integrated now these two department has to talk each other how to go forward integrating these uh, two projects that is the question that challenge that may uh, state governments may face i was just thinking and and i think it's it's uh, it's really great you raised the point about the integration that's going to happen with the new education uh, policy where we've been quite excited and been following that quite closely um i i do want to go back uh, to the question here so uh professor bandi were saying i think this is coming from the presentation that you had made uh, gopinath asks is it essential to ensure child nutrition not only in drought affected areas but disaster affected areas uh, as cyclones do equal damage uh, so that's one specific question uh, that's there uh, would you like to would you like to take that and i i feel uh, mr sahu will also be well positioned considering uh, you mentioned your experience in disaster uh, management and also uh, odisha has had to battle quite a lot of natural disasters but first uh, mr bandi and then we can move to mr sahu uh, i mean it, it's a, a an, an important 
question. I mean, the difference between drought affected and uh, disaster affected areas is usually the, the chronicity of the effect. Um, so a drought effect can, uh, there are some cases where it's short term, but by and large, it's a very long term consequence. Um, whereas disaster, it's usually, usually a rather more uh, immediate uh, um, intervention. But, but obviously in both cases, the, the, the issue here is only about the development of the child. So it's ensuring that the child, whatever the circumstances, continues to develop. I mean, that's, that's the issue with COVID, isn't it? So that we don't, we see COVID is an, is, has intervened. It's a, a disaster, a catastrophe. Um, part of it is because we, we have closed uh, schools um, that deprives children of, a, of their education, a very important time in their lives. So the, the uh, part of the solutions to, to that is, is the reopening of schools, hence the, uh, the focus now on, on precisely that, on, 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 on hurrying the, re, uh, the reopening. Um, but I, I actually felt that, the, that uh, the, 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 the three presenters really did a fantastic job in highlighting um, the fact that India, of course, is very well prepared for disaster, is very used to planning around uh, disaster situations. And I think that's made a, a big difference to the ability of, of India to uh, respond to the current crisis. It is remarkable how quickly um, the states have been able to, to produce a completely new response, completely you know, face a new situation and come up with a, a response to it. Um, in a matter of, of of weeks or months, I think that's that's a remarkable that's a remarkable thing. So linking linking this planning to disaster is is has proven to be um, a very important part of the India experience. Thank you. Okay, it's a very good question actually. See uh, the disasters; so they are uh, local in nature and national in nature and uh, global in nature. So the cyclone, flood, they are local in nature, but this pandemic COVID-19 is global in nature. And with regard to the government of India policy, midday meal uh, service is allowed, permissible, uh, during this uh, um, drought period. Okay, but in other disasters like flood, cyclone, etc., we have the provision of providing free kitchen. So hot cooked meal is available at the free kitchen site where the children can also avail. But because of this COVID-19 pandemic, it has put everybody home isolated, quarantined. That's why government came out with a policy that all the children, those who are coming to the school or who are absent, e.g., absent is also, those who are now home, their entitlement would be given to them. So during this COVID-19 pandemic, all the children who are on roll, they are getting vitamin. Dry ration is being reached to them. Thank you. Uh, Mamta, there are a couple of very interesting questions around fortification, at least three to four. Um, and if I could request the representatives from the states to kindly respond to that. Um, what, the, uh, what the audience is basically saying is that COVID has had an impact on dietary diversity and therefore fortification seems to be a good intervention to address that. Um, also, we know that there are uh, guidelines uh, available from the national level on fortified foods. Uh, so has any state taken action in terms of providing fortified foods through the food basket during COVID times? And if we can get all the three representatives to kindly respond to that. Uh, Mr. Sahu, would you like to go first, please? Yeah. Yes, that is another interesting question. And... Uh, with regard to rice fortification, Odisha was the pioneer and we are doing that in Gajbati also. And very off late, uh, as per the government of India policy, once uh, district has been identified that is Malkanagari, 
and it is integrated to the pds so all the uh, uh, i mean uh, schemes under this food safety network uh, all the beneficiary will be covered under this rice food chain it was about to be rolled out because of this covid 19 situation it is now on hold but uh, there are two other things that we are uh, having now right now one is uh, during this covid 19 lockdown shutdown period our teachers they have reached the iron folic acid tablets to all the children all the children they have received it and they are consuming and three to four districts they have already implemented double fortified salt uh dhenkanal district that was under multi micronutrient fortification uh, pilot project in collaboration with world food program then we decided to have a scale up to 15 tribal dominated districts and it has been i mean per se approved by the steering committee of the state and the new secretary had joined and he has given a verbal go ahead for this project and will be very soon i mean strategizing and launching that thank you very much excellent sir thank you so much ramunta sir would you like to please address the question uh thanks to wfp and especially you people and varanasi has been taken as the first district in uttar pradesh to provide uh, to provide uh, fortified food to the student school children now the uh, process uh, uh, has been started in chandauli district through food and security departments uh, government of india and state government a fortified rice is being supplied there and uh, it may continue in uh, uh, it may continue in the all state districts in case it get it uh, fulfills the government requirements and students requirements thank you thank you so much very heartening to hear that sir uh mr ramrose um any any views on uh, or any plans for provision of fortified foods through the midday meal scheme as part of the covid response yes as part of covid response uh, as i said earlier that we have uh, uh, very young uh, district magistrates in the districts so they are very very proactive uh three four districts and magistrates they even visit the schools uh, during uh, uh, before the pandemic happens they go to the school they sat with the children and they also at the cook meet the meal along with the children and they upload the photos in their facebook or uh, in the you know, photo so that is a very good uh, initiative taken by the respective district uh, magistrates and the state government has been providing the fortified rice food grains to the schools even now also it is continuing and even teachers are also testing the uh, food before the uh, before it is served to the children that is the uh, free covid uh, now even now also the state government is taking step to provide the fortified salt and fortified food grains uh, to the school children so this is how the state government is uh, trying to provide uh, nutritious and fortified food to the school children thank you um sure so thank you i think we just in the nick of time perhaps time for one to two more questions um again to the state representatives uh, this is a question that has come from a participant uh, probably from out of india and the question is that um there are dry rations which are provided to the school children how do we ensure that the dry rations are consumed only by the school children and it is not 
uh, it doesn't become a part of the family pot and therefore consumed by everybody else. Uh, so I would request to go in the same order if Mr. Sahu can respond first, followed by Mr. Mumtaz and then Mr. Ambrose. Mr. Sahu. Yeah. Uh, it is, I mean, uh, the ration that is given to the ch child cannot be cooked separately for the child. It is, goes to the family account. And the family is also getting the PDS uh, ration. So it goes to the common account and it is being cooked and shared by all the members. So the child is getting what its entitlement. Nothing to worry for that. Sure. Uh, Mr. Mumtaz, sir? It's uh, as uh, earlier it has been told by Mr. Gangadhar. The state of UP, in the state of UP, it can not be uh, identified that the provided uh, food grain is only used, being used for school ch children. Because uh, the food grain has been taken by the guardians and uh, the food is prepared combinedly the all uh, family members also the F PDS system through PDS system government has provided the me, uh, food grains to the poor uh, guardians poor peoples so they they are also pro being provided by uh, all guardians are being provided for uh, through PDS, the food grains. So uh, there is no difficulty, I think, uh, being uh, served the uh, food, uh, being prepared the food jointly for all the family members. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ambrose, any points from your end, or do you hold the same view as the other two esteemed panelists? So almost the same view. Uh, however, the food grains uh, which is given to the uh, students to the parents that acts a uh, supplement uh, apart from the parents uh, they get the uh, food grains from the PDS. Sure, thank you. Uh, with that, Mamta, back to you to wrap up and close. Right. Uh, we still have a lot of questions to go through, but I know we've uh, already exceeded the time slot that uh, we had allocated. Uh, so I'm afraid uh, we'll have to figure out a way to get to the other questions that we were unable to answer today. Uh, that being said, I think we can uh, invite our, all our uh, distinguished speakers for your final thoughts uh, before we wrap up. Uh, and we can start. Mr. Sao, it looks like, he, okay, he left. Uh, well, maybe we can start uh, with Professor Bundy and then uh, go across. And please, let's keep it brief. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I've, I, just going through some of the Q&A questions coming in, I saw that people were looking for more information. So I've, I've sent some URLs uh, to Mamta, which I'm sure she'll be sharing through the same, uh, uh, through the same medium. And, and I would very strongly recommend you to look at the, the presentations from the UNESCO World Bank UNICEF team uh, which, uh, yesterday, and the, 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 uh, Mamta has the URL for that, uh, during which they asked the World Health Organization to talk about the evidence for, uh, which, I, which I alluded to, for the low risks associated with COVID in, in school children. And, and let me emphasize, this doesn't mean zero risk, um, but it means that the risks were much lower than we thought they were at the beginning of the epidemic for, for, for school children. And, and that the message, the message is that being out of school is, is high risk and getting kids back into school, getting the school feeding programs uh, back up and running are probably the, uh, the, the main things to be thinking of at this point. Thank you. Correct. Uh, Mr. Ambrose, final thoughts, please. Uh, can we unmute Mr. Ambrose's mic? Thank yeah, you. thank you very much. Uh, the webinar has been very, very beneficial and 
we have learned a lot from the presentations, especially from the uh, Dr. Banti, Donald Banti, and the UNICEF and other presenters. And we would like to ensure that the nutritious food is uh, served to the school children uh, once the schools are reopened. And we will try our best. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Muntaz, your final thoughts? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Mamta. We have uh, learned a lot from uh, Mr. Donald Wendy, you people, and other states experiences also. Thank you. Thank you very much, you people. Thank you for keeping it uh, short and sweet. Mr. Sahu, uh, we're just doing final thoughts. Would, I know I feel you're in your car, so do you, do you want to say something? I'm, I'm on the way to meet the secretary. There is another assignment I uh, told you. But it's a wonderful experience to interact with you all, good people, esteemed panelists. And I thank uh, in, uh, I mean, you and Sarika, other organizations. And uh, I really thank and learned a lot. And my special thanks to Mr. Bundy. I learned a lot from him, from his uh, deliberation and looking forward to meeting you many more times ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So with that, uh, we'll wrap. Uh, see, while I do my thank you, Sijo, maybe you can share the audience, uh, the audience poll that we had in mind. I know it was such an engaging uh, conversation that we really didn't find time to slip it through. Uh, so Sijo, if I can invite you. Uh, as, as we started off saying, this is the first of uh, the two series. So next week, do join us uh, where we're going to be focusing on reopening safely. And I think today's theme where we talked about there is a much more risk with school children not going back uh, also stands, you know, for something we need to deliberate. Um, and I think it's very timely to, to be talking about that. We will have a very interesting lineup of speakers uh, from the NGO sector, from the private sector, from the public private sector, the UN, as well as uh, the Food Safety Standard Authority of India giving a keynote, uh, keynote address there. Uh, it's going to be next week, 11 a.m. Indian time, and we'll send out a separate registration for that. Um, so thank you, everybody, all of our wonderful panelists for taking time for sharing with us. We learned a lot, uh, certainly, and we are so encouraged uh, that we have such an amazing uh, champions to take the program forward. Um, and in GCNF, as we say, onward. Uh, I will also uh, like to thank everyone who worked behind the scenes, uh, particularly Sijo, Mary, uh, Jeshri, Nilima, Nidhi, all our uh, partners, organizing partners, and Pushpendra. Uh, so yeah, with that, uh, are we going to share the, the yes, results yes. of the poll? So I'm sure you see the results uh, in front of you. Uh, and uh, as suspected, uh, there are a lot more that I've heard about the first thousand days, um, a little less, still very encouraging, 66% of the thousand plus 7,000 days. And I feel many more of us will be talking about it. Um, and, and certainly I think the highlight is where 92% of us uh, feel that uh, there needs to be uh, more studies and discussions around uh, child health nutrition uh, in the middle ages. So. So with that, I think we feel we are on the right track. Uh, and uh, thanks everybody who tuned in, stayed on for the over two hours. Um, we hope to see you next week again. Um, have a good day, stay safe and uh, stay healthy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you.